Anyway, welcome. Um, we've got half an hour and we're running a little bit late in the hope that some people can be persuaded to come away from eating their cream cakes and having their coffee. Um, but we've got half an hour in which I'm going to be talking to Michael O'Flaherty, who's director of the European Union Agency for Fundamental yeah. Rights. That us. Let me um, just remind you, because we've heard right from the get-go yesterday from Peter, from the president, from the uh, prime minister, from the foreign minister, the use of the word human rights. There was a session earlier incorporating human rights as well. Let me just remind you, certainly those who are not 100% uh, fully zeroed in on human rights, what uh, is in Article 1 of the Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. So that's what we're talking about for the next half hour. Michael, uh, for those who don't know you, what is your own background? Because I think it's important that people realize it's not just you in Vienna um, with your colleagues uh, as part of the European Union. It's also about you and your background. Uh, thanks, Nick. But just before I get to that, um, you quoted Article 1 of the Universal Declaration. All human beings free and equal in dignity and in rights. And it's so crucial to never lose sight of those words, to remember that they're a statement of fact. We are free and equal. And they're a statement of ambition because we have so far to go in reality to deliver that fact. Well, I'll come and to that in a minute, but just, just, just underline uh, what your own background sure. is and where you've been operating and what you've seen. Yeah, well, I've spent my whole life working in the field of human rights. I came into it internationally uh, in Sarajevo in 1993 during the uh, siege. Uh, worked there for a number of years. I've been in West Africa, Sierra Leone, also during its war. Um, another, uh, worked in a number of other conflict, post-conflict settings, including my own uh, uh, island, Northern Ireland, where I ran the Human Rights Commission, a big part of implementing the Northern Ireland Peace Agreement. I've done lots of other stuff. But I think the, the point about going back over the biography is that I've also multiple grounds of hope. Everywhere I've been, even in the darkest, most awful situations, and there were plenty of them, I found some basis to keep going, some basis to say this human rights project is worth the investment. It will make a difference for our societies. When I was working in Sierra Leone, we didn't know why we were monitoring. It was the most hideous war you can imagine. But we were sending our reports off. They were going to the UN Security Council, but the amputations were still happening. The babies were still being murdered. The rapes were still being propagated. We'd despair often in the evening. But it was five, six years later when I gave evidence in the trials, uh, the Sierra Leone trials, including of Charles Taylor, the Liberian president. That's when I knew the point. That's when I saw why we had invested the effort. That was the basis for hope in this kind of work. Um, yeah. Let me give me 90 seconds because I've <clears throat> been through some of the remarks you've been making publicly in the last few months because you don't sound optimistic. You don't even sound positive. Let me quote to you some of the things you've been saying. Uh, human rights violations persist. Shocking abuses of people are perpetrated or tolerated by governments. The practice of human rights violation is worldwide. Patterns of violation are matched by widespread neglect to weave human rights standards into law, policy, and practice. Even states that champion some rights can disregard or under-engage others. Witness violation accompanied by repudiation of human rights law. And so it goes on. The marginalization of human rights is, your word, overwhelming here. Um, uh, many disadvantaged members of our general populations are not even greatly interested in human rights. Uh, human rights are about others, not about me. And inaction, you keep saying, is not an option. Uh, it's difficult to take honor to human dignity. Uh, these, are, these are quotes from you, uh, because, and I'm putting this, this to you, because there's the, what I wrote down when I was reading this, wow, when you said this. Many states could strengthen their government and lawmaking the human rights mechanisms. For instance, there are still some parliaments within the EU that lack human or fundamental rights oversight committees, and even where they do exist, scrutiny is often limited. Now, I put that to you because while you have hope, the evidence, it's, it would seem to me, quite apart from Ukraine, 
is moving in the other direction. What's yeah. going wrong? Um, the situation is dreadful, and in many ways it's getting worse, but let's not devote the time today to everything that's broken. Uh, we've heard that from other people. No, panels. but if, if it's broken, you, you can we then work to, fix, to it. fix it. We need to fix it, so we need to look to the future. And I think there's a lot we can do. Uh, let me give you a few suggestions. The first is to quote Stéphane Hassel, the French intellectual, indignez-vous, get furious. Get indignant, be outraged about the extent to which we've lost this achievement of human rights. Pope John Paul II described human rights as modernity's greatest achievement. This astonishing story of emerging out of the Second World War and establishing a network of standards and institutions that brought us where we are today. And so much is working from a human rights point of view. Um, indeed, the way in which we focus on what's broken reminds us of what's fixed. We only talk about rule of law because the violations of rule of law, rather, are the exceptions. It's working in so many places. Uh, so we have to protect protect this precious thing. Uh, we're, we're in danger, for all the reasons you've just given, of squandering it. And so we need to be indignant at how we are risking throwing away what we've achieved. Second, but we can have I, to... Can I just, let me just follow yeah. up on that. There are many governments, though, who are, who are saying what you said in one of your speeches, which is, human rights is not about me, therefore it doesn't matter to yeah. me. Therefore, I don't expect the government to take a, a standard principle. Yeah, and this is a commonplace thing. I mean, it's very commonplace. If you go home to your family, just test this. Human rights is about somebody else, probably somebody I wouldn't welcome at my dinner table, a prisoner, somebody that I, I, I don't like. Uh, and, and this is a huge uh, neglected uh, and an oversight. We have failed to demonstrate through standing up for jobs, for healthcare, for security, for education, that human rights is about everybody in our society. For sure, it's about the people on the edge. It is about the prisoner. It is about the migrant but it's also about the person right beside you. And we have to rediscover that through the way in which our leaders frame the big initiatives and uh, through the ways in which we, um, we talk about human rights in a more respectful manner. There's, there's a lot that we must and can do. You've got a great phrase where you say many governments treat human rights like a buffet. Yeah. Uh, they take those rights, that's useful. I'll leave those rights behind on the buffet. They're just inconvenient. And that's a problem because human rights is a set of legal standards. It's non-negotiable. It's not a set of absolutes, and this is part of the misunderstanding that we have to overcome today. There's a commonplace sense out there that human rights is about my absolute entitlements. Of course, it's not. It's every most human rights are subject to limitation in the public interest. Yes, we have free speech, but it's not absolute free speech. Yes, we have freedom to do this and to do that, but it's not absolute because community and society matters. And so we have to do the give and the take. So th this is another dimension of how we have to reframe the conversation. And as for governments and the buffet, uh, the big issue here in Europe is the uh, choice of civil and political over socioeconomic rights. Despite the fact that uh, we have socioeconomic entitlements, I gave you examples earlier, uh, there's a great reluctance in most of our governments to frame social policy using these categories and this language. And that's at the expense of doing the best possible job, above all for the people least able to stand up for themselves on the edges. You're based in Vienna, but when you, when you hear, and you've said it, that um, some parliaments within the EU lack human or fundamental rights oversight committees, and even where they do exist, scrutiny is often limited. Yeah. That suggests they turn a blind eye consensually. They don't want to yet enter this area where you say things are going backwards or certainly not going forwards fast enough. It's not just about a deliberate neglect. It's about genuine misunderstandings uh, and a, a, a limited sense of where human rights apply. Human rights apply everywhere you are a human, in all aspects of standing up for your human dignity. And yet we put human rights in little boxes. We put it in the boxes of the justice system. We put it in the box of prison conditions. It's about every aspect of who we are and how we thrive as humans in society. Um, so I don't think a parliamentarian is often deliberately saying I will exclude human rights from this issue. It's rather this that you, they carry into the parliament, frankly, the same prejudices, the same misunderstandings that are out there on the street. We are talking about human rights, and here I would suggest many people have said human rights because it's fashionable to talk about human rights without giving the second and third sentence, yeah. even in the last 24 hours. Do you think many people, when they talk about the aspiration of improving human rights, human dignity, not just about Ukraine, but about so many other areas as well, they really understand the, the, the enormity of the task that they are discussing and talking about? I'm not sure I'm answering your question, Nick, but 
there's a huge amount of discussion about building better societies, building fairer societies. There's an enormous amount of goodwill. I've spent the last eight years traveling around Europe, meeting with governments, meeting with ministers, meeting with parliaments. I meet so much genuine motivation to build a better world. But what is missing is knowledge of the vocabulary to build that better world. Uh, there is only one universally shared language to build a better world, and that's the human rights system as reflected in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This is the 75th anniversary of the Declaration. Now is the moment to <coughs> just throw it open again, put human rights back at the heart, get people excited, get them energized, uh, get them focused, use it as the way to build a path forward. And by the way, human rights is not going to solve every problem in the world. Take the climate crisis. We absolutely need to recognize the human rights implications of the climate crisis. We absolutely need to bring human rights into the how to fix it dimension. But human rights in and of itself, that's not going to stop the rains. It's not going to stop the desertification. It's not going to stop the heat waves, but it's an essential part of going forward if we're determined to keep humans at the heart of the solution. Are you suggesting that actually, um, as a human right, Tackling the climate agents, uh, emergency is vital for the following reason, that actually people don't realise the enormity of the impact it's having on their lives. We are in a nation which three weeks ago has had a shock of, of mammoth proportions, the yes. kind of don't look now, yeah. um, it, it's coming from the sky, the meteorite if you like. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing, uh, doing a lot of work on thinking the unthinkable, whether it's in Slovenia, whether it's in Tuscany, whether it's in Sicily, yeah. whether it's in Spain, whether it's in Texas, yes. whether it's in, in Canada, people don't believe it's going to happen to them. No. And they don't believe it's going to happen to them when it comes to human rights and abuse of human rights. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The last couple of years, we've just had a firestorm of drama in Europe that brought home to people, my God, my future is at real risk. It's existentially at risk. We have that through the war. We had it first, I think, through COVID. Then we had it through the war, do right think, next do door. Do you think people realise that? I, I yes, think. I do. And I think, because I want, let me just finish, with the extraordinary summer we've had. Uh, finally, in Europe, the, it, the coin is dropping uh, that our future is hanging in the balance. Now, if you live on a Pacific island, you got that ages ago. If you live in a desertified piece of sub-Saharan Africa, you got that years ago. But here in Europe, I don't think it landed until now. And in its landing, in the insecurity, in the fear, in the need to find a way into the future that will carry us all in all of our dignity, human rights is that map. But we need to rediscover it, as I said, breathe the oxygen back into it to show a way forward. You've talked very clearly in recent weeks, we've got a big job to do. We've got to find ways to restore the promotion and protection of human rights. How do you mobilise? Because you've talked about four issues here. Waking up, yeah. wising up, acting up, yeah. and joining up. Yeah. Easy to write here, but what does it mean? I'll give you a few examples. Um, first, uh, wising up. What I mean when I use that term is that the human rights actors have stayed at the periphery of the great dramas of our time. Uh, take the climate crisis. Until very recently, human rights was knocking on the door. Please let us in. Please pay attention to us. We should have been seeking instead to embed human rights at the very heart of the response. Artificial intelligence, exactly the same. Uh, but I, I see a change now, a recognition that we need to get into the middle of the debate. And that's need, for that to happen, we need to learn the vocabularies. I need to learn how to speak to the economist. I need to speak to the meteorologist. I need to speak to the tech expert. They and I need to understand each other mutually. That's only then will we be, be effective in moving forward. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is building new part no, reviving old partnerships and building new partnerships for human rights. I'll take an old partnership. Um, back, I first came into human rights, my interest rather, in the 1970s. And I was motivated by what I saw in Latin America, where I saw uh, Catholic bishops, frankly, uh, out there on the front line, in at least in a number of cases, being assassinated for standing up for human rights. And so I grew up in a context where the faith world and the human rights world were partners in working towards a better future. That somehow got lost over the years. We don't have time to go into it. But we need to reestablish some elements of that partnership, recognizing differences, that's fine, but also recognizing the vast common space where we can work together towards that better future. 
Um, there's many other partnerships we need to either revive or, or, or start from scratch. Um, I'll just give one example, the sports world. This week, we have presented to us in an astonishing way uh, the extent to which the sports world can, can be the vehicle and the channel for the most important human rights discussions. Right now, in the Spanish context, violence against women. Now, that happened... Would you have expected that two weeks ago? No, I would not. I, I wouldn't have expected the outrageousness of it, uh, but also I wouldn't have expected, and again, it reflects the decency in society, the outrage that has been ex expressed in terms of a response to what has happened, which I find very encouraging. Um, there are many other partnerships. I'll name just one. Uh, this morning, I was at the President's panel, the first one in the conference this morning at 9 o'clock. In I'm here. In here, in this room. And I was awestruck by the young people in, in the panel speaking to the Presidents. Um, and, and look, to cut it short, they are they are the reason we can be hopeful. Um, they, they have, it's not about tomorrow. It's so annoying. If I was young again, I'd hate that everybody says, I'm the tomorrow. I'm not, I'm the today, I'm the right now. And we need to listen to them and involve them and help them show us the way forward. And again, there, it's another example of a partnership which will bring enormous dividends, but it's one we're squandering. We're still giving lip service, token service to young people in many of our spaces, I'm not necessarily suggesting bled. Uh, but uh, we have to give meaningful spaces of consultation where we will do active listening and genuine cooperation in, 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 fi in finding the fixes to go forward. Michael, let me invite anyone in the room who'd like to say anything. We've got about 16 minutes left. So if you'd like to say anything, put up a, a bit of paper. And is, is there a microphone we can get to them or they can speak up? So if, if you want to come in, we've got 15 minutes. It's up to you. I can keep talking to Michael and you can keep doing, or your mind can be wandering or you can be listening. So um, just make your, uh, your, your, your intentions clear. Let, let me just put one thing to you, which I shared with you from yesterday. Um, it was in the Financial Times, about whether working on human rights actually now involves, for example, trying to persuade banks not to lend money to countries which are seen as violators of human rights. Is that the kind of progress you think you are now looking for? It's an, assess an essential element of the future. Uh, just think about it. It's commonplace and obvious that most of the risks we face in our lives these days don't come from the government, they come from the private sector. Uh, and, and so therefore, if we cannot get the, the private sector compliant with, respectful of human rights, uh, we frankly don't have much of a future. Um, the, uh, the role of the business world is absolutely vast, be it for us or be it for anybody anywhere in the global supply chain. Have you got leverage there already? Leverage is coming. Uh, we're, we're, we're the toolbox is improving. Uh, in the, in the the European Union, for which I work, is developing tools. Uh, we have a taxonomy uh, set of regulations emerging, uh, which will, over time, impose human rights compliance requirements on the business sector. We're not there yet, but we're going in the right direction. Uh, we have a lot of other tools. Um, in the context of artificial intelligence, uh, we have a, an impressive effort at regulation, uh, which will tame the in which I believe will, in large part, tame the industry. So we're, we're going in the right direction, but we cannot forget that controlling the private sector is critical to ensuring respect for human rights in the future. Do you think there's a willingness? I've been doing all this work on thinking the unthinkable, thinking the unpalatable, and that's where we are with a lot of human rights. Do you think there's a willingness by those at the top of big companies and smaller companies to actually engage in these issues? To some extent, yes, and in fact, I've found what the curiosity. What persuade them? I found the curiosity that the higher you go in the bigger in the bigger companies, the more of an interest there is in pursuing these pathways. Um, but what I find often is nobody knows quite what that means in practice. Take example, take for example the tech industry. I have many conversations with tech leaders, and they get human rights, but they don't fully understand it beyond privacy. They, see, they get the point that human right, privacy is a human right, but then once we get into discrimination and how AI, for example, can discriminate, they get lost quite quickly, but the goodwill is often there. Uh, what's more, we have evidence, um, that, and I'm no economist, so I won't go too far with this, but we have evidence uh, that investing in values in the pursuit of your financial interest brings a more sustainable financial yield, a better profit. And so therefore, the smarter companies are recognizing that attention to human rights is also good for the bottom line. Because there's a, um, there's a comparison and a parallelism with nature and what we've seen, what we've seen too with sexual violations and so on, and what we're seeing with Me Too. In other words, can you see uh, almost a pincer movement developing in which human rights becomes a real pressure on institutions 
where they've got away with stuff up to now, but it ain't going to last much longer. It can be a pincer, but it's not, it's not a given. It'll only happen if we stay incredibly focused, smart, and tactical, also choosing our battles. Right, take the microphone there, please, for the lady. And do introduce yourself. Yes, hi, my name is Natasha Van Elliot, and I'm from the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs here in Slovenia. Um, thank you for this really interesting debate. I feel a little bit conflicted about talking about human rights and business and private sector because I feel that the, I used to work in, the, um, in North Africa actually uh, up until last year and um, the local authoritarian elites who are also business elites, they hijack the notion of human rights in order to promote themselves as um, particularly in Morocco for example, in Tunisia up until very recently, not so much in Algeria. Um, but um, they sort of hijack the notion of human rights in order to promote themselves as this um, um, island of liberty in the sea of, of authoritarianism in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, and Could you put a point quickly because yes. we're running out of time? And so, so they hijack the notion of human rights in order to sell what you, exactly what you said in terms of um, the right to um, private to own to private um, sort of ownership and so on. So can I put that to Michael, the and, hijacking of human rights, yes. so I got it and right. I just wanted, yes, and I just wanted to say, but we of course forget about um, the most existential human right, which is the right to life, which means the right to clean water, the right to be able to go to school, um, um, to have quality and, uh, you know. But, uh, you're saying is there, there is a real abuse of these principles. Yeah, um, well, look, thank you. And I, I, thank I, you very much indeed. I, I completely Anyone else? Please, at the back. Keep going. Okay, I, I get your point, and I, I don't disagree with you at all. But what's the alternative? Uh, yes, some, some bits of the private sector will exploit human rights uh, to, to, to get an advantage, which is purely commercial. But we need to talk to them. You mentioned clean water. How are we going to get clean water if we don't get the water companies on site? Uh, so we have to have the conversation while aware that we're sometimes being manipulated. We had a massive manipulation in recent times where nasty people were suddenly invoking human rights over the COVID restrictions. Um, the fact that nasty people were invoking human rights, uh, sometimes very cleverly, was not to somehow undermine human rights. Um, uh, and in fact, they probably did us some service. Uh, but again, it's a further example of the type of exploitation with which we have to live. We have to sit down with the people who are impacting human well-being if we're to deliver uh, for human dignity. Michael, are they pulling wool over your eyes? Do you have the evidence? Do they believe you don't have the evidence? And therefore, they, they try and make clear in their view, they are whiter than white on this. Well, a lot of business is extremely well resourced and can mount very effective arguments. Uh, what we have to do is invest in the evidence ourselves. That's what my agency does. We do the world's largest surveys on the lived experience of what it is to be human in Europe from the human rights point of view. And we, with our colleagues in the European Commission, are constantly rebutting the sort of false claims or the, 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 the mischievous claims uh, uh, to the country. And it's effective over time, uh, but you have to play a long game and recognize that your adversary is very well resourced. Because I was listening to Frieza, your communications advisor, yeah. uh, in a separate, um, yes. separate session about hybrid warfare as well, making yeah. that point, we've got to check, check, check. Yes, and another speaker on the same panel talked about how you have to invest the most enormous resources in countering misinformation and disinformation. Uh, the, it's, it can't just be 10 people in a ministry lost somewhere. It has to be a recognition of, of a vast campaign across a breadth of areas over an extended time, and only then will you be successful. Please introduce Two yourself. Two short questions. My name is Patrick Claudio Platon from Romania National Administration Association. So, first question is what we can do more to stop the human rights violations in Ukraine, so to stop leveling the cities, bombardment of civilian infrastructure, and so on. And the second is how your agency will increase the presence in the Balkans in order to promote rule of law and in order to make the leaders in the region to understand that if they want to integrate in the EU, they have to fully comply with rule of law. Thank Can you. I modify that first half of the question? How worried are you about what's happening in Ukraine being repeated by many other authoritarian autocratic regimes who now believe they can get away with it? Well, just, let's just make sure they don't get away with it. Let's make sure that the sustained, united front against the, uh, the barbarity of the Russian regime uh, holds steady. Uh, and in answering your question, we, we must maintain criminal accountability for crimes. 
Uh, and I welcome the fact that the criminal accountability dimension has been there from the beginning. We have to keep that there. We have to keep investing in it. We have to keep investing in the institutions that will deliver the, ju the necessary justice. Putin wasn't able to go to South Africa this week uh, for the uh, BRICS conference because of the arrest, the, the arrest warrant. That's positive. That's encouraging. Uh, we have to record what's happening in Ukraine uh, 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 to ensure a, a global justice, uh, a, a fair and a proper reconstruction, but also a, 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 a justice delivered. Uh, we have to remember to take account of what happens to the most marginal, forgotten people in Ukraine. I think, for example, of Roma. Everywhere, by the way, Roma get pushed to the edge, forgotten. And we have to remember them in the context of doing an assessment, uh, an understanding of the reality in that country. That won't stop the fighting, I give you that. Uh, but it's, it's, the, it's part of the contribution of the human rights actors uh, towards navigating through this hell uh, towards a better future. And then the Western Balkans. Um, Western Balkan countries that are... Um, candidate countries to the European Union can apply to be observers to the Fundamental Rights Agency. And so we would strongly encourage those that have not yet done so to do it, because once that happens, we can engage with them on the territory, just like they were an EU member state, and we can offer the capacity building support, the data generation, all the things we do to try and make things a bit better. We can do that in Ukraine and Moldova also, if they choose to become observers to the agency, something I'd really very much welcome. But again, picking up the spirit of the first half of that question, when you look at the horrors, and the BBC is running um, a long piece today about the number of bodies which, which are being discovered, um, which are, who are victims of the war, Ukrainian bodies. It's, it's ghastly stuff. Yes. And we know what's been happening with things like mortuary, railway cars, and so on. My point is, when you look at what is there, there is in parts of Africa and parts of the rest of the world, there are those who, saying, who can say, Russia is getting away with it, we can probably get away with it too. Yeah. I mean, that's what can I do but share with you the huge concern. And if they do get away with it, then it's an existential moment of failure. It's not just a failure in terms of what's happening in the rest of the world. It's a failure here in Europe. It's a statement that you can repudiate everything that has been achieved, every value that's been reinforced, every standard that's been gained since uh, the Second World War, that somehow they stand for nothing. So uh, we, we have no alternative. Uh, the aggression has got to be halted and, the, um, uh, and, and Ukraine given every support to rebuild itself uh, as, as a fully functioning state in full respect for human rights. So this is, this is, this, I don't, I'm not telling you we're going to succeed. I'm not telling you we're going to win. I'm just saying that the issue is existential. Finally, what about your thoughts? We've got, is there someone else who's got their hand up? Please, just very quickly, because we've got two minutes only. Yeah, I have two quick questions as part of Young PSF. And my first question is, do you see uh, cancel culture movement as something useful for human rights or something dangerous? And why is it more popular in America and not in Europe? And my second question is, are there human rights without animal rights? Uh, okay, difficult questions. Um, uh, cancel culture is, is, is you know, it's a kind of a popular term that doesn't have a fixed meaning. It can mean different things to different people. Um, uh, expression of outrage against human rights abuse is really welcome. Uh, I was very impressed in, in the context of Me Too and so on, the extent to which human rights came onto our streets, which then triggered important changes in policy. Uh, it's it's, in, it's in, in response to the killing of Mr. Floyd that we now have an anti-racism policy in the European Union, and that's because of the outrage on the streets. That's very welcome. The new attention to colonialism, the impact of colonialism, the legacy of slavery, that's incredibly welcome. This is all good for helping us go forward. But at and the, the same time, and the reparations that have and been the reparations paid. discussion suddenly, that's, suddenly. that's suddenly suddenly moving quite quickly. Uh, uh, but look at how the initiatives on reparation are actually by the families of the uh, slave owners, not by states, including uh, in uh, Ireland. Uh, indeed, Ireland hasn't even begun to discover its own uh, background in this context. Uh, uh, we may have been a colonised part of uh, of Britain, but nevertheless, we supplied the civil servants for the Indian Raj and for so many other settings. So we haven't even begun the conversation in my country, but the. Um, uh, what I wanted to say was, in terms of cancel culture, that um, we have to be very careful to respect human rights uh, in this context. We do have freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is subject to limitation, but it shouldn't exclude every voice that we don't like. 
Uh, you know, the great thing about universities, used to be at least, that you could get the full diversity of views, even frankly outrageous views, which helped me form my own views. Uh, and I would hate to see that put at risk uh, through some exaggerated application of this phenomenon. And now the, 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 the colleague mentioned animal rights. Um, the, yeah, you know, I have a pet. <laughs> and and, 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 and uh, I adore that little dog. And, and I, would, I would throw myself in front of a train rather than have the train hit the dog. And so I do find myself having to challenge myself. I focus on human rights, that's what I know, that's what I do, but I'm not going to dispute anybody who tells me that we need more attention to the rights of animals. All right. In the context also of the ecology, the environment, saving our planet, uh, that's a discussion we need to have, though I have no expertise on it. Michael, we have one minute, literally. I'm just going to summarize and you can comment about the six proposals you have. Get back to the law. We need to evidence our claims. Third, and this is interesting, go local. Yeah. Uh, fourthly, get the message across. Build alliances. And above all, create new education opportunities for the next generation. How much of that is achievable? Oh, so much. First, get back to the law. What I mean by that is everybody's talking about human Quickly. rights, and we need to recognize we have legal standards. Uh, don't just claim things and label them as human rights. Point to the standard. That's how I've been successful everywhere I've worked, um, because it's objective. It's not just my opinion. Second, go local. I was a few months ago in Poland, I was in Lublin, I was in Warsaw, I was in Gdansk. I was so impressed by the mayors, a reminder that there's so much energy for human rights, for decency at the level of our cities that we have to exploit. And finally, put human rights back in school. Um, you know, we don't have civics, as we used to call it, in, in, in many classrooms anymore. Um, the, the, we, we need a shared ethic, uh, something that will, will bond us as societies oriented towards the good for our communities. Human rights can provide that, but only if it's given a chance, right back to what we said at the beginning, and the key to that is children. So teach them about human rights. They don't have to become human rights lawyers, but they have to get fired up by the Universal Declaration, and then we can make a better future. Michael, you've made clear it's a long haul ahead, but there are some early wins possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.